Welcome to the SSI Orbit podcast, a forum that explores everything pertinent to digital trust. And I'm your host, Mathieu Claude. We recorded this podcast episode right after that crazy weekend with all of that open AI drama when Sam was fired and there was the Microsoft stuff happening and then Sam being hired back, all this drama. And so um, wasn't able to ask a first question. The, we were just kind of talking about what was going on. So it was a bit of a cold opening, but I just wanted to give a bit of context before the audio starts so you know we're discussing what was happening with open AI. Enjoy. Uh, you know, human nature, what do you do is <laughs> yes, yes, that that's 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 the sad part in all of this. I I don't yeah, yeah. really know whether this will have an impact on substructures similar to the OpenAI Foundation being set up in the future to govern emerging technologies and fast moving technologies, or is it like it's everybody's going to step back, take a lesson from this and say, okay, you know what, we don't want to do not for profits in this. It, it has to be far more structured and a bit more uh, VC uh, capital and innovation oriented. So I don't really know the ramifications of this, but it's going to be serious. That's for sure. Yeah, yeah. This could be the the, um, the, the end of a, you know, this sort of a very ideal driven structure. And it might become much more traditional. It becomes a uh, ownership or, you know, the, the, the class, more traditional capitalist structure with regulation. Maybe that's what it's going. Because uh, the, um, it, it, it turns out that, uh, you know, at a certain point, Ottoman even said this should all, in the end, belong to the humanity. Everybody should have it. But that's, you know, just a very nice notion, like exactly how this um, users can use it, how they can be regulated, uh, how do we prevent the bad things to happen, they haven't really figured out. There has always been this idea that technology has to be for mankind. Uh, there is a stream of thought that Bronowski and others have always talked about this, that technology has to be for mankind. It's a very well put together cohesive idea but there's not always been a very good implementation of the idea in terms of like how do you what do you mean when you say technology for mankind do you create a federation <laughs> exactly. coalition and and not for profits have been i think the governance model for a while and uh, yeah, the open have, folks, uh, yeah we can potentially have i mean even like uh, the easy portion of the knowledge right the the uh the information and knowledge for the mankind, even that is very difficult. Because yeah. today, we uh, the way we can convert knowledge into practical, powerful tools are very easy to do. And so even knowledge alone becomes extremely difficult. Um, so we, we can see they slowly or very quickly stop sharing uh, the information itself. And the system naturally looks like a, we can have anybody to use the system. Uh, anything more powerful, you know, than the casual uh, tools, probably have, will have to be somewhat regulated. What we know how to do, or in some some fashion, is uh, for the regulation to be democratically, you know, conceived and and have a rigorous debate and maybe the execution or the enforcement be transparent um uh, those are th that that people know how to do it at least whether they can do it well that's a different question at least there is a one way we could try to do it better but uh, just naturally somehow to you know put some tool into the uh system itself and uh, you you know um, they are working on this soup align alignment. Uh, current alignment is a very crude and simple. So anything that uh, scientifically we could put in the tool in something that's better than what we have imagined in the past seems to be really hard to do. Makes me think about uh, just the messaging application signal as well, right? It's kind of a not for profit. They just said recently it costs them. 15 million dollars a year to operate this thing 
so you wonder if all of these like non-for-profits in the future are all gonna run into issues and it seems like whether or not it's running a company like this or even coming up with like good solutions to mitigate some risks like ultimately the best way is just like whatever promotes free market and capitalism and for-profit companies because the incentives are just driven top down by that yeah one of the earliest uh, um uh news rep- what I, I forgot where I read it now, it says, oh, the culture war come to AI. Um, because, uh, you know, uh, just making some organization nonprofit only moves some factors away from the, the conflict. And maybe, you know, commercial or money driven purpose are being taken away. But we all know, like nonprofit does not mean it's somehow ideal or, or completely even neutral. Um, a nonprofit is still, you know, clearly governed by some people. People can be driven by, by money, but can, people can also be driven by ideology. People can be driven for vanity. People can be driven for many other things other than just purely money, right? And. Uh, uh, whether that's better, I you know some people will think that potentially worse. Um, the, some of the worst act that the humans you know had done in the in the history are not driven by money, um, and and uh, so so I think that's made uh, you know this made that very clear. So just because something is a nonprofit in a uh, in in country that. Uh, um, it's not a U.S. That doesn't really make it any better. And so, what we believe in those, um, it's really hard to. Um, we 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 can simply use that as a notion to say, oh, you know, this is something we can trust. Um, I think decentralization or transparency are still a more practical way. They are not ideal, but they are. Um, much more practical that we had uh, much more practice on such a governance model um, to uh, to make sure that it doesn't go into a, a horrible condition, that systems are more reliable, more robust compared to alternatives. Because, uh, you know, the key word, this magical notion of nonprofit somehow is, um, you know, all virtue driven, and that's, not the case, right? There's this other ca- other situation, right? That uh, nonprofits work for probably certain types of businesses and models, but not necessarily for models that are initially very capital intensive. Uh, sig- the the one that you spoke about, Signal, it's obvious that the operational expenses are fairly high, and to be able to meet those operational re- expense requirements through raising fundraising and all of that will require mm-hmm. you to make some. Uh, challenging adjustments to your mission, near-term plans as well as mid-term plans. Right. It's fa- it's fairly obvious that if you are trying to build something that is that is yet not as mature as a technology as you'd like to be. I mean, let's face it. Everyone is fascinated with AI and whatever OpenAI and others have done, but really, it's all of us also agree that it is not. It's it's still on the curve towards getting to be mature, predictable, uh, more. I think the uh, the buzzword is more enterprise ready, and 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 all of that. And and for us, the buzzword is that is it more trustworthy or not? And and in that case, I don't think probably nonprofits are are, are perhaps the way. that's pro- that's perhaps the only lesson that we take away until the uh, the fog of conspiracy clears out that uh, in this kind of situations, nonprofits are not really essentially the way forward, and one shouldn't be immediately very trusting of. Uh, structures that just because they're non-profit, you, we assume good, good and great things out of them. And 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 that's I think uh, uh, you can see they had uh, this discussion, you know, many years ago when they are uh, cr- initially creating OpenAI and then later on introduce these uh, complicated um, capped profit structure, right? Um, is trying to uh, do a compromise, you know, some way in halfway. And uh, um, which made this board very, very um, crucial, or they, they become the soft spot of the 
this uh, governance model. And uh, the, one of the comments... I think the board actually had a very hard task in front of them. I don't know if they realized it when they got constituted and they were forced to take decisions, but I think they had the hardest possible tasks in front of them because <laughs> they were already hobbled by the various pieces of the charter. And yet yeah. they were also supposed to incubate and productize uh, all the technology and research that was coming about. It's a hard yeah. place to be. Yeah, and and uh, in one of the comment uh, Ottoman did was he thought the board should be much much bigger with lots of people in it, and essentially you know creating a diverse representation of all these values. But I don't know whether that would uh, make it easier. It would definitely make the battle much more <laughs> dramatic and complicated, probably. <laughs> um, you are right. It's an impossible task for them to do. And uh, in, in this case, it may turn out to be, because it's so small, it becomes very personality-driven. But if you make it very big, then it will be a cultural fight, right? It will be camps and... You know, it will be a fight like uh, in um, uh, in the Congress, I guess. Uh, um, but the fight, you don't have a lot of facts to, um, or you are you are be you you are fighting a, a research direction in a way because you don't really know what is going to happen, and each of these uh, takes a lot of money too. So the combination really is very hard to. Um, to uh, have a, a, you know, provide a real guidance to a company who or a group of people who can focus on a project, a, a, a goal they have to go achieve. That's really difficult to do. We, we kind of had a cold open here. We've been talking a little bit about some of the recent activities happening around the company. Open AI, and I think definitely focusing on just governance is the right lens to take. I think in this whole space of AI, it kind of leads into to this: is that we just get so caught up in kind of like doom type of things or the news every day, and just um, around what's happening. And it actually makes me think of um, a Warren Buffett documentary I'd watched a long time ago he just never watches the news because you just get caught up from week to week and different stories different things that are just irrelevant in the larger scheme of things and it doesn't really help you to uh compound your knowledge on a specific topic and it leads into AI because I think whether or not we're following the drama around open AI or just um any reporting on it to kind of sets us kind of it puts us in the wrong spot we're debating stuff that maybe is just straightforward to explain and part of the genesis for this conversation is when jing and i had done a, an initial podcast on looking at the crossovers between digital trust and generative ai since then i think we all read a book the coming wave by one of the co-founders of uh, deep mind um which seems to recite similar arguments again that tries to explain statistics computing advancement moore's law same thing that we hear kind of over and over again. So in the spirit of just uh, allowing ourselves to try to focus on either like taking first principle approaches or just focusing on stuff that we think are going to be important for, for the long term, it might be useful to just talk about some of the misconceptions that are out there today, whether they're statistical misconceptions, computational misconceptions, at least getting ourselves on the same page to have a fruitful discussion, which hopefully we could, as it moves forward, move towards more of a practical solutions to, in our world with the intersection of digital trust and AI, like how do we make sure that all claims that are made could be validated, verified to the authentic source of that claim? So maybe I'll throw it to you, Wenjing, and we could kind of tee it off with that to just clearing up maybe some misconceptions, either statistical or computational or whatever else that kind of exist or seem to be widespread today? Yeah, I can think of many of them, but uh, I will probably, uh, since you mentioned statistical, I will mention, uh, I'll probably start with the, um, the the idea or the claim that, oh, these are all statistical models. And they, um, you know, some of the mass media um, 
uh, articles would immediately jump into say, oh, this, this is just, you know, a bunch of monkey hitting keyboards and got lucky um, sometimes, right? Uh, it is, uh, it's, it's nothing to, to, to worry about. Um, I, I think uh, we we really need to have an intuitive notion of what the statistical means. And in this case, or in most of the even you know, natural science, uh, we realize that world is, is statistical. So a, uh, most of the important conclusions that, that we know about, um, uh, they are statistical. And so the world really should mean that uh, it is it's what the, what the world is is how we behave It's most likely how you know um most of the uh life uh, behave as well so uh, there are no less of a law of nature than um uh, what we you know, used to think of the classic science we we learn in in high school um and uh, to me like it's really unfortunate that the statistics is not taught as a as a uh uh, a mandatory, you know, science or math class in in high school. I think they should, because uh, we, we shouldn't just think of a uh, statistical as some kind of a uh, random thing. It's not. It's that the rules are very clear, and that m might be, you know, the the rule that really govern uh, most of the things we do. And so, in this case, I think complex systems are more likely um, to be statistical driven. And so these, I think, uh, um, is special for intelligent systems. I think that, that we shouldn't simply consider this and somehow, you know, um, uh, devalue what the, the system's doing. So that's probably the first thing we should get rid of, uh, not to think uh, the word statistical in that sense. All right. So, uh, I mean, uh, there's a misconception that uh, the AI uh models around us are able to logically reason and be able to uh, create a lot of uh, argument-driven uh, responses to queries that are put forward to them. And and this originates from how, what Wenjin explained, that the, the base misconception about not understanding statistical models correctly leads to the idea that we treat all of this AI and intelligence systems as magical black boxes without understanding the fundamental constraints that go inside of them and not having those constructs and leads to misconceptions that then pan out that we think we also then span out our doomsday scenarios that okay these are coming to replace us at some point in time so i think that's that's one of the other things that eventually uh, originates from a fundamental misunderstanding of what it is yeah a good uh, theoretical or I think if we get away from you know the the series and uh, um, and, and mass all that, um, if we think about psychology, which is study how human think about problems, uh, we think always statistically anyway. And so I think that would be much more intuitive way of thinking about. It. That's how we should have taught statistics uh, in school. Is the reason is really very simple. You. You think about, uh, you know, a lot of the cases happen and that seem to be more common and you tentatively make a decision. You say, oh, oh based on, you know, the, all the things I have experienced in my life or I've seen, we think this might be true. And then you go collect more information. You, you ask other people around. You tentatively believe in something, but uh, you ask other people, you ask smarter people, right? And you do statistical reason. That's what all we do all day long. And that reaches a certain conclusion and that not guaranteed to be true, but more often than not, they are. And if you really ask the smart people who've also done what you have done, then you combine all this information into something you truly believe. And and I think I think that's you know that's how those algorithms eventually work as well. If they yes, they are statistical, and that's what we live our days every day um, as well. So uh, if we think that way, I think um, these uh, these systems are not mysterious, and they are just mimicking uh, in a lot of ways that how we you know do our decision making day to day as well. Yes, yeah, so I guess having more philosophical discussions, debating if these things are 
conscious or not, or e even debating stuff like uh, AI is being weaponized. If we take a statistical lens, because the cost, any technology advancement significantly reduces the cost to do something. So if, if, if we agree that you could look to achieve some negative outcomes by using some generative AI system or a combination of them, like statistically there's bad actors in the world there's going to be a percentage of them that you know if the cost is low enough they're going to do stuff so focusing on that maybe isn't the the right lens or the right conversation to have as well right yeah i uh so i can comment on that one that's also directly related to the the recent uh, drama news uh it is the uh the fact that uh, these systems are definitely on profit and they can uh, relatively easily be abused today. And so um, the cost is quite low already. And uh, so the the one of the steps uh, OpenAI had done uh, was last week in the uh, uh, in the development um, day um, uh, workshop or conference in San Francisco is they uh, enabling these agents to be connected with uh, outside systems. So instead of a chatbot that's contained, now that you can use an API and for the chatbot or GPT-4 uh, to be able to then call other APIs. Uh, so essentially now you have a Im far imperfect system, can be abused, and now this system is given in a way a virtual arm, right? It's not physically into a robotic yet, but um, now it's given a virtual arm. This arm can go call a function in the cloud or call your own software, which potentially can go do a lot of things, including, for example, automated, fully automated and relatively smart hacking or um fishing or you know all the, the the things we already familiar with and they are quite bad already um but that this whole process can be not be uh, fully automated and the only thing i think that standing in the way of trying to prevent this from happening is some diligent human or there are developers or engineers watching somebody not doing that that's that's as far as i, I can see and so this, I think, is uh, definitely a danger uh, very, uh, you know, right away. And it's, it's happening. It could be happening um, in this election, for example, in U.S. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised to somebody go try that. And so that's, uh, I would say, immediate danger of uh, what, what we have currently. And a lot of people have talked about this as well. Uh, beyond uh, uh, OpenAI, you could do this already even without it. You can use uh, the open source version of all those and 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 give this up. It's relatively simple to do. There's a whole full uh, software stack for it. So uh, this could happen, um, I, I think, very soon. Having uh, good underlying tools also encourages and creates an ecosystem of applications and services to be built around. So essentially, a, a, a substrate that's more popular or more technologically advanced creates a richer ecosystem. And that leads to higher risks of abuse by using those tools and systems than anything that's not yet so popular. And uh, and that's that's one of the challenges, right? Because it's the this entire span and breadth of this technology is emerging pretty much as we speak there are new things happening and we can't keep up with it so the regulatory environment has also been very uh, light touch probably only at this point being very value driven focusing on transparency provenance and and all of that and not a lot like the regulatory systems we see for other technologies which are far more uh, how do I put it, quantitative in nature in terms of you can actually measure things and be able to determine whether something is right or wrong, legal or illegal. And you do, uh, if I if I read the uh, recent uh, executive order that came from the Biden White House on, on AI, it is still, it's well written. It's, it's comprehensive, but it's still light touch. It's not really there yet. Probably the regulation that follows it might be a bit more uh, stronger in terms of the phrasing and, 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 and wording. 
if the provenance is the important piece here, so whether like a, an AI is calling a third party system, like if it's robotics or phishing or whatever it's trying to do, or if it's just creating a piece of content, ultimately it just comes back down to, does it come back down to an authentication problem that needs to be solved here if you need to have the provenance? And if so, like any knowledge base authentication doesn't doesn't work well enough to, to guarantee you that whatever is trying to achieve their phishing or the robotics or just doing something you need you need something stronger than that no is, is that a solution that whether you want to create content and you want to have trusted authentic content or if you just want to have authentication in your system to make sure things are done in a trusted right way according to your policies don't you have to have something better and is not a solution that works across the board so uh, we, we don't think there is a solution that uh, we have discovered yet. Um, so there's, I don't believe there's any existing solutions or proposals out there would actually quite, you know, satisfactorily solve this problem. Um, once you have a very intelligent system, naturally, like Changsha uh, mentioned, right, people want to use that in real applications. Of course, that will require the system to connect with other systems. And uh, uh, which, the, you know, the more you connect, the more useful it is and also more dangerous it becomes. Um, the, uh, so the solution we have uh, known today are mostly to sort of a, um, create a, a, some kind of a baseline, at least say we will um, put aside this longer term, more uh, fundamental problem first and see what we can do um, for a better system today. It's definitely not going to solve the whole problem, but at least it's better than what we have today. And uh, uh, seems like uh, um, you know some of the this light touch regulation it's on that notion as well. That's why most people read the regulation um, would say, oh yeah, that's points being you know actually talked about. Uh, makes sense because there are those are more concrete and short-term things that will at least benefit. It doesn't solve problems uh, fundamentally, but it will benefit from um, we we will benefit from I think uh, uh, from those uh, if those are, are, are actually implemented. And uh, um, so I think that's that's a philosophical approach again. Some people. Um, are doing this so-called super uh, alignment, which is really fundamentally to see how would you um, control or regulate a intelligent agent, right? And uh, uh, that's a research problem. It's not solved yet. Uh, the second level of people, uh, what we can do is, okay, we have some known tools and can we apply those tools and at least make the current situation better? It may not fundamentally solve the problem, but then we will maybe, you know, gain in some of the uh, benefits immediately and also give us more time to work on the longer term uh, solutions. So uh, I think uh, content authenticity, um, uh, it is one of those very practical things we could do today. Um, the, the, the algorithms are known and uh, we know it will create uh, uh, benefits, right? Uh, I think in, in again, in, in Biden's uh, executive order, uh, the uh, narrow application was to use that to all the documents and, and stuff that the government issued themselves. And so they will basically sign and put, you know, uh, these uh, this, uh, um, uh, of content authenticity signatures on the things they release. And that would definitely um, be a good thing. And potentially that can be spread to, you know, most of the, uh, for example, news media, or there was suggestion to Elon Musk uh, to apply that to uh, tweets. Um, so uh, he, at least on, uh, on the stage, he seemed to be open to it. And if we go do that, um, it doesn't solve our problem. People can still get around that, but potentially in, in a large degree that can uh, help um, make uh, the some of the information being spread out 
much more trustworthy in the short term. I think that, I think that's the key part that uh, we want to see the the path towards more trustworthy content to be able to identify content that is generated from AI systems or others. And provenance is one of the stepping stones towards getting on that journey. So we need provenance one way or the other. The trouble is uh, even provenance today, if we just look at the tools and methods available today, we have to freely admit that it does a few things well, but it doesn't address all the risks or, or security considerations or even the uh, the faking that could that is possible. So the yes. focus is on the on the on the right right path, right aspect. That provenance is necessary to be able to deliver something that uh, the consumers find more trust in. Also, to be able to reduce the risks, uh, security risks from using these systems, because that's the other part, right? Because we don't talk about, we don't often talk about the security risks. We talk about the fact that okay, you, I I cannot understand something. And hence, I find it untrustworthy. But untrustworthy has security implications. And if you are, if you think something is not secure, you are not going to have more services built around it. The ecosystem will not uh, emerge. So there, there are the there are ramifications that need, need to be done. And yeah, there is. Uh, I, I think one of the very commonly used methods is uh, that has been tried so far is watermarking. Uh, with a reasonable degree of success, I wouldn't say it was successful, or it's been very foolproof or anything. But it's a start. It's a good start. In the large degree, we can see these um, uh, more like a immediate attempts in two big champ. And so one of the one is a sort of a do um, explicit um, metadata. So that is to I think is best used to address the problem of people too trusting because we today we trust any natural looking image <laughs> as real, <laughs> right? Uh, we not we don't have enough um, doubt uh, today, um, and so one way to to do that is you mark it. And so trying to, I guess, uh, convince, you know, viewers to actually pay some attention and check. I don't know whether we will be able to do that, but, you know, it's an attempt to get the general public to be have a habit of looking at a picture and ask the question um, every single time whether this is real or not, or whether this is authentic or not. Um, uh, but you know, so so content authenticity is an attempt to to uh, to you know make them ask the question at least <laughs> in some way behind their mind to see this as a question uh, every time they see a picture. And uh, uh, for the few who are diligent, in, especially if there is a controversy, for example, there's a fake news going on in you know in X or Twitter. Um, this might be useful because then once this alarm goes off, you could actually go consciously check it. Um, the second one is uh, the watermarking or especially like a hidden watermarking is trying to solve a different problem. Uh, it's trying to um, uh, solve the problem of uh, the owners be able to um, uh, sort of make a claim of this image, or you know, it's it's me that uh, uh, owns this uh, this picture, and um, to do that, you will need to be able to say that the watermarking you put on, because it's not visible, can not be removed robustly, and that is a much harder call. And we have a lot of research saying that's pretty hard to do. So, so far, the algorithms that uh, people have come up, it's useful in certain way, but, uh, you know, it, it is removable. And uh, presumably, once, you know, if you actually uh, massively use it, somebody is going to come up with a, some open source code, which, you know, <laughs> everybody will be able to just remove it very easily. So that's, uh, we, we're getting back to, into remember the um, compact disk <laughs> problem. <laughs> you can try to encode something, and then you know somebody you know potentially a high school or college student will <laughs> remove it, <laughs> and it becomes that uh, not very practical. 
But uh, I think if we're talking about social impact, uh, not copyright and you know digital uh, and, and intellectual property protection, then maybe a visible marking is more important. And to mark it visibly as a as a as an indication to the user to say, pay attention to this. Um, I, I don't know how practically uh, uh, we will all will adopt to that new mode, but uh, you know it's a good try at least for some documents. Uh, you know, government one is a one uh, for, for for a good example, but also like news media, definitely a very good example. I would love to see all news media or the paper or pictures they show have this you know information embedded in it. Right? Maybe that will be a good start. What does content authenticity mean? That it's just not from a machine or it just means whatever the governance of it says, says it means? I think content authenticity is probably at the very primary level means, am I able to understand where the origin of point of this was? Uh, because let's keep aside the, uh, the question whether a machine or an intelligent system created it or there was a human behind it. Uh, fundamentally, any content that we consume, there's an uh, intuitive uh, aspect to it that we have during the consumption model that we want to understand where it came from, by which eventually the question boils down to who created it or who is the owner of it, which is essentially what we have been kind of trying to uh, also circle around. In. And, and this is the right time to probably pin down that doubt. And it's a hard problem at this point in time. There are... It's not been solved outside of AI system content yet. So it becomes even more complex. There, there is this thing that I think one of the challenges that we also have in our perception is that we think there's the, the uh, synthetic content is generated by a single monolith system. That's not always true. You could have multiple systems chained together in, in an input-output pipeline mechanism to be able to create content, at which point you have to have authenticity for all instances that make up that pipeline and that becomes even more harder than uh as you progress in the mode. absolutely so so that's exactly how this system uh, works today that's it's designed not for ai actually it's designed for the world before ai right some guy people um using a uh, photoshop and and doctoring you know stuff and so this this is again um, only a, uh, I would call a positive tool is for somebody who want to tell you that my content is authentic, that I took the picture and I did these um, steps in my Photoshop, but I assert that uh, the result is authentic. I'm not trying to fool anybody or mislead you for bad purposes. And one way to do that is I disclose how I did it, essentially. So that's the procedural steps that happen to this picture before I release it. And again, that's a positive side of tool, right? And you are assuming this author is actually a, a genuine and, and, and you know, good-natured person doing all this, and you can make a declaration um, for that. Um, does that helpful? Yeah, I think it is helpful. Again, you know, we are going back to the the government and news media good examples. Whether they, I think they want to do those things. They want to say, "Here's I'm transparent to you. This is what I did, and these pictures are believable." And and please, you know, trust it, right? Um, but it doesn't solve the uh, the the user does not come from that perspective. The user want to manipulate you. Uh, for whatever reason, um, I don't think that solved that problem. Even if the user can fully, transparently, honestly trying to tell you all the truths how he did it, they can still hide a lot of uh, um, misleading and other information in it, and you will have no say about it. Besides, like uh, this immediately goes into the security problem because in order for that whole chain to be trustworthy, then you need the, the camera to be trustworthy. You need the Photoshop to be trustworthy. We know that's not the case. I can then go back and hack the uh, the, the camera. I can go then hack a, a version of Photoshop. And then 
all the bets are off anyway. So this is a not a uh, it's not a full proof system at all, and we're not even talking about AI yet. And AI can easily, if AI can make up a picture, AI can make up the history as well, and make it very convincing too. <laughs> so, so I don't I don't think this uh, solve those problems uh, per se. It does solve the help the uh, honest um, person to be able to generate a transparency. The uh, driven, you know, sharing of information uh, that can happen, but uh, that's about it. You still rely on the fundamental uh, security problem and uh, whether you can trust those information per se. And the secondly, even if you can trust all those information, then you still have to make a judgment: is that good or bad? That that, that we don't know, right? I like that. This uh, we're talking about AI, but not really. We're talking more about digital trust here. But in the realm of digital trust, one of the things I like about the vision is that you're able to separate protocols from the end platforms or wherever the end users engage with with other users or or with a platform. Right? You have these protocol layers. Is that how you envision content authenticity? as well because it's like where, where does that get solved right so you, you have examples today of content authenticity like if we take x formerly known as twitter as an example they have a mechanism of community notes that they, they rely on the community to try to debunk stories for example that's one example of trying to solve content authenticity but um in a world where you have tons of these platforms that provide distribution for content do you solve it at the platform level or do you solve it really at the content creation level? Uh, how do how do we practically look at solving that in the short term? You want me to go first? <laughs> yeah, go I for it. I don't, I don't think people know exactly how. I think both the, uh, the, the, the tool level and the platform level have a solution that need to be part of it. Uh, so uh, again, uh, content authenticity, we take that as an example, right? We, we mentioned in the tool level, the, the camera, where the picture was taken, that's the source of the original information. So in order to solve that, we come back to a very simple security problem, is whether you can engineer something that's very hard to hack. And I think that's the notion of a wallet and that's a notion of you know some kind of a um, identifier um, that that can be secure and, and and believable, and so those are the fundamental I think of building blocks to make a tool or the source of information um, more uh, trustworthy in in that sense, right? <clears throat> in the beginning, that's the funda- you know, foundation of these uh, the source of information. So that's step one, but the social problem. I don't think it will be solved by that. That will simply be a component given to now you have more information given to the platform. And the platform is where the social engagement happened. And assuming nobody would be able to actually go individually check all this so-called content authenticity information yourself, even if you believe those are true information, it's very hard to consume it by in the individual level. So that problem still need to be solved. And that will have to be uh, in, in with today's solutions will have to be in the social level. And presumably, uh, it will make that uh, problem slightly easier to solve. So you would only need you know, a small number of people, users in, in X to go check them and do the verification because verification can be also be fully or more automated. And so you are more likely to be able to check through a a long history and detecting something sounds like not right because there's a more thing they have to forge it, right? So the forgery is now harder to do and the checking is fully automated. um, So it's more likely to have a a, a balanced um, uh, uh, chance to detect any forgery in, in that system. So that potentially can help and maybe tip the balance to the other direction. Uh, that's yet to be seen, yet to be proven, though. 
I, I would like to probably differentiate between what I see on the social mediums that is more commonly known as fact checking, which is more, uh, I, how do I put it, uh, socially outsourced to the audience and, and they provide, uh, but that's even that is contested and we, we have seen it in various geographies during uh, very highly topical events that fact checking becomes the battleground for alternative facts as well or alternative truths. Uh, but leave that aside for the moment. I think one of the challenges is that um, earlier this month, there was this paper that was that was published called the Levels of AGI. And it provided yes. a kind of like a, a six, I think, levels in, the, in, in the lens with which you could actually uh, uh, think about AGI. And surprisingly enough, uh, I, if I remember correctly, Chad GPT and others were in the level two, which is emerging and not even uh, at one of the le uh, levels nearer to six. So to me, this proves two things. One is the fact that as an implicit agreement among certain groups of researchers that there is uh, there's a need for narrow AI systems that provide functionally complete experiences for the user on a certain limited domain of topics. Um, whether it's going to be about content authenticity, it's I think we, we are still yet to see good use of AI for that. Because right now, the model that we have is very skewed towards having human reviewers, the heavy human intervention. And uh, I don't know whether we are at a stage where we can say that if we let loose AI systems on these content and they provide uh, a collate, curate uh, the what seems to be out of place and provides the correct facts, whether the audience would be able to accept it until the point they are able to be certain that the AI system is correctly configured and not feeding them even more worse facts. So that it boils down to the fact that what, are you able to understand the AI system to some extent to be able to believe in what you are consuming through that system? Yeah, it, it's it's kind of funny, right? It almost sounds like a chicken and egg, but it's not. It it is it's, it's essentially is a very simple set of foundational elements that need to be robustly available and understood. So that at one point in time, you uh, you kind of believe that, okay, this is safe enough to be part of my life. It's like, I think the Im immediate thing that comes to my mind is the uh, the evolution of internal combustion engines or even the electric vehicles. That at some point in time, they became safe enough for consumer-grade usage and, pe and, and the consumers believe that, yes, I, I don't need to be at risk to be using this. I could actually go ahead and use it because the components creating that system are stable, predictable, robust, and I understand it to an extent. It isn't like one problem, like, so we could talk about how things are perceived, like even if a piece of content is generated by an AI system, like what, what, what's the intent of it and, and so forth. But one problem that we're just seeing today is just strictly like, is this content from an AI system or is this content not from an AI system and just from, from a person? Yeah. Is it, is that like a very immediate problem that can be solved? Because you brought up the example before of it may be used over the next election. I'm sure it will be used. There's going to be tons of content that's going to come out from AI generated systems and just knowing whether or not a piece of content you're consuming, whether or not you agree with it or not, but just knowing if it's just coming from a human or an AI, because again, it, it's more costly to come from a human. Therefore, there's, there's a higher barrier of producing it. And whether or not I, I trust that, it maybe maybe helps a second, me. Uh, a secondary point. Trust is the secondary point. The the where the origin source. But then again, if we have to understand the origin, it it, uh, it eventually boils down to the fact that are we at a place where systems can have identifiers and those identifiers are listed somewhere that I can look up and say, oh, this denotes an AI system, and uh, this AI system is owned and managed and operated by such and such governance the rules and governing authorities and I'd, and then my trust task is whether i choose to trust the output of that system but um we were discussing not so i mean hardly a few moments ago that identifiers are a difficult notoriously difficult problem to solve on the internet a, a system and framework that is designed to encourage anonymity and then we are trying to say that we have to put in identifiers when you mentioned wallets wallets is a good a uh, way to think about identifiers and being able to have persistent identifiers that can be uh, assigned to systems. But then you do need a, the concept of a registry and somebody to manage that registry. So it 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 is a, it is. I think I 
my sense is that we understand what is needed. We just haven't managed to complete all the smaller tasks required to get us to that point, from point A to point B. We know the path at this point to at least of some of these problems. It seems though, like as soon as you you say you need a registry, there needs to be a root of trust. Like I think we know well enough in the space that you could achieve like proof of humanity or something without divulging all of your PII and your your whatever whatever you or your government's personal identity. There's ways of doing it, but the second that a reg registry is mentioned, it's just it's just a no go altogether because it becomes very political and uh, very quickly. So you wonder if that's how viable of a solution that is for widespread adoption in the short term because no one on a political side of things will put their back behind this type of thing because they'll get absolutely demolished i think uh, um every system uh you can go all the way push all the way to the root right, as fast as you can and eventually you will reach a place where there will be a registry and so the question really is about how far you push to it so that only a small component uh, being, you know, dependent on a registry or some kind of a um, uh, not automated system. And I think, uh, you know, especially when we talk about to, to our community, why right, people need to recognize that. And uh, um, so so I think that is where these would come will eventually come in. I think we share a goal of trying to give the uh, identity to the, the the party, the controller that, that they should do, right? Um, but uh, all of that requires assistance, and that assistance usually comes from somewhere. And we can minimize it. We can push the this route further and further away so that uh, that the registry are only in control of some mechanical uh, systems and probably does not know enough about the um, the, the applications and the day-to-day -day activities you are doing uh, uh, that you, we really concern about. So I think that could be the ultimate solution is that you have uh, in the end, like today, for, for instance, we, uh, we are doing our computation in in computers and you know the physical device and the chips that are produced are essentially uh, based on trust of some kind of registry or regulation or the um, the, the the parties we ha had interacted long enough to have sufficient trust. You may not you know in zero way hundred percent trust them, but you have sufficient enough. So those I don't think are the much more fundamental problems we are talking about. We are talking about a, with AI is the issue of whether A, we can know what the things came from, like who created it and what they did to it before we seen a video or article, or whatever, right? And the two, how an individual, a common you know, um, consumer can look at this and decide whether to believe or whether to rely on it. Or how can we make sense of this thing? And we can even so far talking about just the mechanical information, whether this you know picture was like you mentioned, produced by a AI um, a software. Uh, is that useful? Maybe I, I would say <laughs> it may not be very useful. Like it's, then what? You know, we, we have a human and uh, just using, you know, regular software can produce lots of things already. And and that potential is more dangerous because the human probably comes with, a, with an agenda, right? Maybe the AI system is uh, less of an agenda driven as of today. <laughs> um, so eventually we have two category of problem. Both are very, very hard to solve. And this so-called um, registry or, or those things that we are only talking about the easy, relatively easier problem of simply mechanically looking at how information or bits are produced. The secondary problem or the second level of problem, uh, if you look at the, you know, you, people used to call them semantic level, right? Once you're in the semantics level, then you have a, a really well, we tell you all the information about this, 
image, do you believe it? Well, that's not straightforward. I will tell you who, who wrote it, you know, I'll tell you who produced it, what tool they use. You still have to make a decision whether you can rely on this information. And as uh, uh, Samsha alluded to, then once you're in semantic level, you can get into meta-semantic and meta-semantic, this is, there's no end to it. Um, so all that is opened up once you have um, this, you know, so-called AI system in the loop, then, then this potentially can go higher and higher in levels, and it just make the intrigue or you know misleading uh, information in a more uh, sophisticated way or more subtle, um, and all of that could become um, very quickly you know to these platforms very soon. Uh, potentially they are already spreading potentially this you know next election could be the uh, opportunity for all these uh, players to start to really show up um but uh, uh, we need to remember that uh, we are not stuck in trying to debate a old debate i think is still going on on uh, on these uh, very uh, um, uh, i would call it more mechanical systems in low level structural systems um, and uh, very quickly, we will see more semantic-driven systems, and, and those will be even harder to detect and, and, uh, um, and, and trying to help the user to recognize, right? Um, it's, it's a very um, time-consuming for, for individual persons to really detect those things. I think one of the takeaways that is it's not gloom and doom, but how far the average or uh, ordinary end consumer of content is invested in understanding uh, the difference between synthetic and not synthetic content and whether it matters to them. And so that's one part of the debate. It's like a, a, a lot of the focus that we have today in specifications in various bodies that are going on is about being able to ha handle the authenticity and the provenance thing. The question obviously is, the sidebar question is, does it matter in our everyday transactions with such content? And if at all, uh, how are we now dealing with it? Because it's not like these kind of contents is not being provided to us now. We may not even understand it because the contents do not come digitally watermarked or specifically mentioned that these are synthetic content. So evidently we are living in times of synthetic content being created, fed to us, and provided to us. So that's point one. The second thing is, uh, do we understand the risks? Uh, Wenjing has mentioned uh, the the political risks uh, in, in coming elections al uh, already. And technologies and systems like these are geopolitical problems as well. It's not just specific to one nation. It's going to be... Uh, used in many many ways across various countries in, in many circumstances and leading to uh, strange outcomes that we don't have we don't have handle on they, they'll be probably they'll be called unintended consequences as well so I think I'll go back to something that is usually uh, uh, understood in a negative sense the concept of Luddites uh, in the way in the early 1800s, the Luddites were the folks who actually understood the impact of emerging technology on their lives. Yes. And even though today it is it is used as somebody who dislikes new technology, the actual history of the term is to be more cognizant of the impact of the technology, the, the social impact, the economic impact, and the general impact on politics. And to be able to take a, a very uh, comprehensive decision in terms of how you deal with that. Uh, Obviously, any such a, a decision also includes destruction of property, as was evident throughout the times. But it is necessary for everyone to be uh, very uh, uh, conscious and mindful about understanding it before taking a decision and, and being able to uh, figure out their path to navigate through it. Technology and all of the tools that we talk about will provide some path, but the individual human concern has to also find their own path. Without it, it's going to be different. Because at the foundation of all of this is, what do I trust? Who do I trust? And how do I trust? 
And these are the three key things that drives all our interactions. But I, I think it's a fair statement to say that most humans like strive for the truth, right? Whether they believe something is truthful or not. I think ultimately people are, are searching for truth in, in many different things in life. They just, they're just, we're all influenced in one ways or another, other based on our context and what we're consuming and, and, and so forth. But, um, that's where it brings me back to like a, a lot of the conversations we're having about like registries and trust registries. It's just, it's just then about like, I don't know if there's like, we started the conversation, there's no like ultimate solution for this thing, but it's just about starting to provide more inputs, which hopefully if their inputs are a little bit more widespread, it can help people make trust decisions, however they, they want to make it. But is, is that one of the first steps to say like, if we look at, hey, what are we going to do in 2024 in this space? Is it just finding ways to either through like signatures or more information and metadata or just watermarking? It's just, just providing more inputs that are going to help folks make their own decisions as they're seeking truth in their own context? Yeah, again, you know, the, the, the two general approach, right? One is a very practical, say, how we can do today to make this situation a little better. And I think uh, providing that kind of uh, uh, basic truth, uh, it's, a, it's a good way to go. I think that's very doable and uh, we should, uh, you know, make the tools more mature, easier to do and more reliable, scalable, so that these kind of uh, information can be made available uh, right away. I think that's the right, way, right thing to do. Um, there is a, higher level problem uh, uh, it's very rapidly emerging um, I think we should also be um, aware of those and uh, recognize that is the fundamentally in the end the real problem to solve so I think both um, something we can act on right away and uh, providing the um, uh, the the basis of identifiers and 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 <laughs> wallets, right? Uh, construct them in in robust enough that it can be widespread and used. Um, that would allow then more and more this uh, authenticity uh, information, the metadata, being widely um, adopted and used, um, showing up in different social platforms and the platforms will support the user of that system, right? The platform from in the end still need to be able to help the consumer to read that metadata very conveniently, for example, right? Just come up with an easy, relatively easy way to consume that uh, metadata. And all those I think will be, uh, make huge difference. Uh, it may not fundamentally solve the long-term problem, but you know, that long-term problem will, will need time to recognize them and need time to figure out more solutions uh, as we go forward. But this would uh, solve in the immediate, some of the immediate problem right away. And it's uh, also a way to sort of uh, make us all be conscious about how to consume data. Because you, now you have to, even if very, very convenient, that you have to mentally check it. And uh, you know that habit of thinking and consuming digital media I think uh, it's something like the entire population need to learn. And, and, and maybe the short-term goal is to achieve that. I think it's worth uh, for us to remember that all the things that we are collectively working on, uh, be it verifiable credentials, identifiers, wallets, registries, these are still not very widely adopted, deployed, and widely consumed. I think uh, if we are able to drive the situation towards a place where these become more part of our everyday interactions, then use cases where other innovators could come in and say, I'm going to use this protocol specifications and objects that exist and build tools that help consumers deal with content, that that could probably be the what we are looking at in the near term, to be able to ensure that that push happens. Because we are talking, we know the uh, the current state of, let's say, wallet adoption, uh, inter non cryptocurrency wallet adoption. Let me be also very specific. Uh, <laughs> so, if we are able to uh, make a good situation, a positive impact for all these things to be adopted, 
more clearer specifications and open standards to be established. I think we would be on a good path to create ecosystems where uh, content authenticity is a challenge that uh, people can step up and, and take a stab at and to be able to drive it. In my mind, it's almost like a seatbelt thing. You know, when, when seatbelts are necessary in a vehicle to keep you safe, they don't necessarily save you from rash driving or vehicular accidents. But if you didn't have a seatbelt, the consequences would be more worse. So we need all of these foundational stuff to be ready and available and useful before we can convince consumers that you have things that you can use and you can, and there are others who are building on top of it. I'd like to add one uh, notion for, for our audience out there. Um, I think we value our personal agency very much, right? In every aspect of our life. And there is a pessimism out there that think that that's not possible in the digital domain. I think that's the fundamental problem we're trying to solve. And with that empowerment, I think people come up much more creative ways um, and eventually, you know, really master how to be a digital person, digital citizen, how we how we live our life with a lot of digital information around us or tools and, and, and systems, right? And uh, that agency fundamentally comes down to something, some truth you can rely on some tool you can rely on and uh, and you know i think a wallet is just this this thing we can actually touch and use and can individually evaluate whether you know that's that's good system uh, but that's something as close to as a practical tool that each one of us can have you know a large degree of control with and that would allow us to actually be in a position to do all the things we talk about. Um, otherwise, you, you you basically, you are nobody in, in this world. And you feel like your entire life is controlled by some mysterious, you know, whether it's a big company or big government and all those things out there. And we, we don't, we feel very pessimistic. This is all doom, right? Um, but if we think about what do we really need to start um, like regaining our own agency and I think we need some good tool that belongs to us. And, you know, a wallet is a very visually identifiable thing. Maybe talking about identify is a little too abstract, but the wallet is very clear that can you trust your money into, into this, this software? It's, really, it's much smaller. It's, you can have better control of it. It can be better defended, right? Not, not you know, rapidly uh, uh, hacked like a, your your computer uh, operating systems today. It's not very trustworthy today. Um, so, so that's uh, I, I think that's the concept of wallet. That's essentially give people some feel of agency, and you feel comfortable doing things in that world. Um, and enable you to then you know potentially make your own decisions what to believe. Yeah, I, there's way too much doom today. Yeah. <laughs> People think things are, are getting worse, but when, when you actually look at just many different facets in life, like literally everything is is improving. There's obviously problems in the short term, but I think uh, important, like you said, to say, hey, like for uh, if we do have fears about losing uh, personal agency, we do, we do have these these tools here that we could just keep improving. In the short term, we've identified problems, but long term all of these advancements in life driven by technology are, are progressing us forward. Um, yeah. So I guess yeah. I, I would leave it on that, that it's just, let's maybe try to move away from the doom type of conversation and more towards uh, optimism. Exactly. Right. Too much doom out there um, and too much afraid of, of uh, uh, you know, these social society institutions out there. Um, I, I think in the end, we need to uh, find the small ways to leverage these uh, institutions we, we've uh, we've come to know uh, over throughout the, the long history, right? So that uh, um, it's not perfect, but uh, um, uh, we have learned how to use imperfect systems for our benefit, and we should do that here as well. 
Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoy these conversations as much as I do. If you haven't already, make sure you subscribe to this podcast on the platform of your choice to make sure you're notified of new episodes that may be of interest to you. If you're looking to connect, feel free to reach out directly to me on LinkedIn or Twitter. Catch you all later.